Okay, this is the uh, pre-lecture uh, YouTube on uh, linking people, prosperity, and conservation. It's the triple bottom line from a sociologist perspective. Uh, this is take two. I did it first time, and apparently I had no sound going, so uh, we'll do it again. And I think this will take uh, probably uh, 20 minutes. Okay, so uh, on Tuesday, we'll talk a bit about uh, the tragedy of commons. Chris will cover this, and I'm not going to go over it, but it leads to uh, a sort of framework to thinking about natural resources management. And it, the tragedy of the commons uh, envisions a, a, a village commons or a feudal commons and, and um, tries to understand why it is that we tend to over-exploit uh, resources. And that uh, given that we do this, uh, and we'll explain why we do this or what the theory behind that on Tuesday, uh, there's been three classic options. One is to uh, legislate restraints. So we have fishing limits, no-take zones, hunting licenses, timber sales that we, uh, the government takes control of those natural resources and uh, legislates restraint of their use. And therefore, we have things like national parks, uh, reserves, uh, and things like the Endangered Species Act and CITES. Uh, the other uh, options are to privatize uh, ownership so that uh, landowners take control of the long-term interest in sustaining some uh, livelihood. And this is why we might have um, fisheries that have uh, harvestable uh, owner, owner, court, owner shares of quotas or uh, lobster beds that have ownership locations or uh, ownership of timber and things like this so that you can privatize the ownership under circumstances where uh, sustainability in the interest of the owner. Uh, and the third one is to create cooperative institutions and that allow for joint uh, uh, ownership and long-term care. And this has been a focus of what we're going to talk about on Tuesday, uh, community-based uh, conservation, is to try and think about how you make those institutions work for the people who want to, who have these resources. So, you know, going back a step, uh, we can think about the primary alternatives for how conservation has uh, occurred, and we think about command and control sorts of uh, approaches, the U.S. Uh, Endangered Species Act, the FLTMA, NEPA, these are top-down, government-run, um, government-mandated programs to try and make sure that we uh, deal with our natural resources in an appropriate way. Uh, at the international level, there are similar kinds of things like CITES and Ramsar and other sorts of, uh, Ramsar deals with wetlands, other sorts of international treaties, the Convention on Biological Diversity. But at the end of the day, uh, it's mostly cajoling because the international uh, bodies have very little um, uh, oversight and uh, authority over what individual countries do. Similarly, NGOs have no uh, authority over what individual countries do, but uh, through their support, uh, they can cajole governments into action through uh, money and resources. And examples are things like WWF supportive rhino patrols that some countries can't afford to put patrols out on the ground. WWF pays for them, for the vehicles and the gas and the, and the, and the guns, the weapons, and the country then provides the people. Uh, international aid, USAID, World Bank, UNESCO, GDZ in Germany, other those sorts of things, try and cajole good behavior through uh, direct funding of, uh, of, of programs. And then there's this, these uh, bottom-up local governance models like uh, community-based conservation. And then, um, of course, the natural capital project and these kinds of things that suggest that if we put it into an economic context, you can make things work out. We did that, that last week. So... Um, we're going to talk about a variety of these and get down to why community-based conservation is uh, popular and often uh, used now. So uh, we think of parks in this country as being, you know, federal land. Uh, we think of Forest Service, federal land, BLM, federal land. Uh, this is just in here to say that we should be thinking broadly about these kinds of protections that are more or less top-down in that there are a lot of countries that um, privatized property long before they uh, started the process of reserving land and so have um, protected areas that are largely in private ownership but have a large amount of government control. So the lower left uh, shows Snowdonia uh, National Park in Wales. 70% of the land is private and there are 27,000 people who live in the park. Up in the Lakes District, up in the upper right, a lot of this was land either donated or uh, uh, brought into the public portfolio uh, through easements uh, through Beatrix, Beatrix Potter, uh, and she has a mandate 
or set a mandate that these would be working landscapes that would lead uh, raise uh, Herdwick sheep. She was a prize-winning um, um, sheep owner. And so you have these protected areas that have a, a lot of government control and constraints on what you can and can't do, but the land itself might be largely in, in private hands. Uh, this kind of uh, <clears throat> movement away from that approach has been building for the last 20 or 30 years. And so uh, the IUCN has these World Parks Congress. There was a Congresses. There was one in 2014 in Sydney. It was about parks, people, and planet, inspiring solutions. But these started in 62 in Seattle. Uh, in 72, it was named uh, National Parks, a Heritage for a Better World. Uh, uh, 82, Parks for Sustainable Development. I know Parks for Life in 92. But uh, in 2003, it's beyond bent bound, uh, you know, benefits beyond boundaries. And uh, a, a large function of the World Parks Congress in 2014 was thinking about uh, privately owned parks and, and where to move from this old fences and fines approach, which is widely viewed as not being particularly uh, uh, successful because that they create something that is biocentric and that we can't um, do that everywhere in the world with success like we can, in, for example, in the United States. So uh, a classic example of this is Tanzania, that Tanzania has an amazing number of parks and game reserves, uh, a, you know, well over the threshold of the Convention on Biological Diversity targets. However, uh, they were mostly uh, historical uh, European-driven hunting reserves for this fellow down in the lower right, and they displaced the people down in the lower left um, uh, that who, for whom those, these were traditional uh, homelands. And so... Uh, not surprisingly, parks are, uh, been, have been viewed as elitist neocolonialism and that uh, this is a, a problematic thing. In fact, uh, earlier in the quarter, we talked about uh, Tompkins and his um, pretty remarkable private conservation efforts in Chile, building this big program down the southern end of the southern uh, South America. But uh, you, you can go on to ISI Web of Science and look at green grabbing. Here are some of the more uh, uh, widely cited papers, Green Grabbing and New Appropriation of Nature, Enclosing the Global Commons, uh, Global Green Grabs and Biochar, Global Green, uh, Global Land Grabs, Why Green Grabs Don't Work in Papua New Guinea. So basically uh, railing against the, the way that this is just an, a new version of colonialism and just the wrong way to go about uh, protecting natural resources. Uh, so natural resources driven by the wealthy elite uh, and on the backs of um, poor people. And not surprisingly, this a lot of this is in the Journal of Peasants Studies and is really worried about um, uh, environmental justice. So indigenous rights uh, are uh, uh, be have become a uh, an acute issue with respect to setting aside uh, protected areas or setting or or, or developing restraint on natural resource uses uh, in the developing world. And basically, the, the, this view is that conservation said neither have the right nor the authority to preclude indigenous peoples from their traditional lifestyles and, in the name of conservation. This suggests that the fences and fines approach of setting aside a park is not just unsuccessful, it's unethical, and that we shouldn't be doing it. Um, and this brings up, uh, really, I guess, a tension among uh, empathies and rights. The rights, on the one hand, of animals to exist in their habitats and the, uh, and the desire to maintain biodiversity versus the rights of indigenous peoples to maintain traditional lifestyles and a desire to maintain cultural diversity. And then the problem really is, is those two things, uh, because of uh, uh, modern economics and uh, advances in human health, and resulting in increases in population density result in an inability to maintain both those things at the level that we would, uh, that people would like. So uh, this indigenous rights movement has grown hand in hand with this uh, community uh, cooperative models of conservation as an alternative to um, um, the uh, fences and fines approach. And you know, the big uh, and conservation NGOs, uh, uh, Nature Conservancy, World Wildlife Fund, Conservation International, BirdLife International, these are all uh, right there in this mix, viewed uh, as a part of the government and the problem as opposed to part of the uh, people and the solution. And they've all been working hard to uh, uh, revise that image and change it and, and become different kinds of organizations. But here is a paper from a number of um, uh, years ago, you know, using the master's tools, neoliberal conservation and the evasion of inequality and basically asserting that uh, uh, bingos, uh, the big NGOs, are, are viewed as a problem because they go for high 
profile, big projects, bring a lot of money in, and they effectively become the government in, uh, in, with respect to natural resource protection and not uh, become an advocate for uh, the people. Well, so there's lots of different structures for how to integrate people into uh, 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 into conservation. The man and biosphere reserve model was developed in the 1970s. There's lots of man and biosphere reserves around the world. But the idea is you envision a core area where you're protecting nature, a buffer area that's somewhat used, and that you have human settlements around the side, and that this idea of uh, an integrated conservation and development project uh, says that you can involve stakeholders in setting goals and bring in investment from outside, a little bit of government oversight, and you can in, uh, alleviate poverty through human development. And by alleviating poverty, reduce the pressure on uh, the biological resources. So there's lots of lots of biosphere reserves around the world. I'm not going to stop at this. We're just going to keep, keep going. Uh, but that this has been in, uh, you know, a, a one approach to thinking about uh, uh, integrating people into conservation. So uh, the theory of change in the integrated conservation development programs is that people are the biggest threats resource uh, and that diversifying these local economies give people alternatives to exploitation and that these do aid dollars can then leverage uh, sustainable economic uh, development. Now, not, uh, not surprisingly, um, uh, th this has been going on for 30 years. Uh, there have been everything from direct payments to cease actions to compensation for damage from nu nuisance uh, wildlife to programs to, uh, re to employ people or re-employ people, developing ecotourism, and uh, that there are many, many, many successes in terms of poverty alleviation and, uh, and bringing economic benefit to, uh, to regions. There's a lot fewer um, <coughs> examples of that resulting in, in positive conservation outcomes. And uh, we'll talk about, about that on, on Tuesday as well. So, but th fundamentally, this uh, emerges from this problematic pattern. This is a paper from Andrew Balfamford a number of years ago, uh, but it basically shows that uh, species richness and human density uh, co-vary, and that uh, the same things that drive certain locations around the world to be high, uh, to be high biodiversity uh, places are also places where, where people live. And as a consequence, this problem is, uh, is acute. And so uh, there are a whole bunch of new ideas beyond fences and fines and part of this whole notion that's going along with aid in general that uh, Africa, it's time to stop giving um, uh, money to Africa because it just gets squandered and spent badly. It's time to start uh, instead of, of sending money through aid organizations and sending aid people to Africa and paying a lot of that money to Africa to those aid workers that it's time to develop structures so that Africans can help themselves through their own internal uh, development processes and things like this. Uh, I'm not, I don't want to go too far down that path. But this whole idea has been translated into conservation, thinking about community-centered ideas. Uh, it can be called community-based conservation, community conservation, community-based natural resources management. Uh, there's lots of different uh, guises uh, for this. And there's a long literature that supports this in terms of thinking about how this uh, could, could work. So there are conceptual models of self-governance of natural resources, Garrett Hardin, Tragedy of the Commons, that we mentioned at the beginning. But before that, Eleanor Ostrom, who's a real giant in this field, uh, died recently, um, uh, was thinking about collective action in the 1960s and then moved on to these things like governing the commons and crafting institutions for self-governance. And Arun, Arun Agrawal at Michigan and Carl Folk are also uh, big voices in this field about thinking about attributes of these communities that um, succeed, that help um, communities locally govern resources and Carl Folk thinking about adaptive governance in that if we think that we don't know what to do with managing natural resources and we have to take a ma uh, an adaptive approach to those resources, well, the same thing applies to how we think about peop people and their governance. And so we should be setting these things up as adaptive systems where we plan, act, monitor, and then learn from our experience and, and change things. Okay, I'm going to stop at this slide and then I'm going to finish up uh, on a second video.